Hi, and welcome to the Nashville Post conversations with the mayoral candidates in the runoff. I'm Stephen Elliott, editor of The Post. We're here at Aiken Partners Peabody Plaza for a conversation sponsored by Baker Group Strategies. Today, we're talking with Alice Rowley. Alice, thank you so much for being with us, and congrats on making the runoff. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so we'll just jump right into the questions. Um, if you're elected um, mayor, you'll inherit, inherit several uh, legal fights with the state over the airport, uh, over the racetrack, over the size of the Metro Council. There's some various other things out there, I'm sure. Um, would you want to continue those fights? Would you appoint a legal director who would push the, continue pushing those forwards, or, or would you look to uh, scale back on that? Well, I think uh, for some of those um, some of those challenges, I think we'll have worked through pretty close to when the next person becomes mayor. But I would say, I, I guess you, if the question is, how would you consider restarting it? I would look at Music City Convention Center, right? That seemed to have started as a fight, but we have worked out uh, some ex officio members from the state being part of the Music City Center and, and sort of structured a new board. I think in the case for the airport authority, uh, there is probably a place for the state to have similarly a seat there. Uh, the state has contributed really after fees, the largest single investor in our in our airport, right, city government. So is there a place to find uh, a middle path like we did with the Music City Convention Center for the airport authority? I think there might be, um, but we have to let that first work through the legal challenge that it's in and then sort of figure out is, is there, if neither of these are valid legally, is there a third, uh, is there a third path we could come up with? Um, on the question of the racetrack, I think that's another example of well-intentioned public policy that wasn't truly thought through. It seems to me like a lot of that fight is whether or not changing the racetrack is a demolition or if it's a reconstruction. And that seems to be where the question is, is it 21 votes or 27 votes? Mm -hmm. And it's all back to probably uh, some vagueness in that initial charter, uh, in, in that initial part of the charter. Well, speaking of the racetrack, I think in the context of the, the Titans Stadium debate and some other debates, I've, I've heard you be uh, skeptical of using public funds for mm -hmm. sports stadiums. Mm -hmm. Do you think that applies to the racetrack too? Well, the racetrack plan that Bristol has put out seems to me to reduce the public's uh, the, necess the necessity for the public general taxpayer dollars to have to go into rebuilding or, or sort of reconstructing uh, the racetrack. Uh, so what I've said on the case of the racetrack is that we did put in the charter that racing would always be at the speedway, the same way we put as one of our government's goals that we're going to take care of our people and uh, make sure our streets are safe and our kids are you know, going to a school uh, that their parents choose. Um, and so I, th I think on the question of the racetrack, we have spent so many decades under investing in it um, that, uh, that the combination of dollars from the Convention Visitor Bureau from the state and then from Bristol and some revenue bonds, I think can actually remove that obligation from our, uh, our, our, our taxpayers. Even if the backstop is Metro at the end of the day? Uh, well, I think even in the case of MLS and most of our work, me Metro or the state is ultimately the backstop of probably anything that we do in city government. Yep. Um, our last conversation at our forum a couple of months ago, we talked about um, you know, your desire to get Metro's finances in order, mm -hmm. w whether that's on taxation or spending. And you also want to um, fill empty positions in the police force mm -hmm. and, and maybe even grow beyond that on the yeah. police force. That costs money, obviously. Yeah. At the time, you, you mentioned parks as an area <laughs> where <laughs> there may be some bloat that yeah. could help pay for that. Yeah. Can you expand yeah. on that? Well, I, yeah, and I, I, I think um, what, what I think people feel broadly in the city, and it's not just in parks, but it's, it's also in our teaching positions and also in our police force, is that uh, the front line is less staffed than it needs to be, and there may be too many layers. So I, I, think, I think I was not reflecting on, um, and, and we, we saw it, right? We saw it in this last budget conversation, all of these frontline positions empty at the Parks Department, right? But there's a lot of middle positions that are full. So um, I, I think 
you know, if, if I'm sitting there and saying, what's the number one goal for the parks? To serve the people, to have uh, concessions open, to have golf courses running, to have the parks maintained well. And if I'm sitting in an office, but I've got all these empty frontline positions, then maybe I need to move some of those people to the front line, right? I mean, you see it. You see the empty positions and you see uh, challenges that we have there. I mean, on the question of revenues and thinking about how do we become uh, the chief revenue officer of the city, how do we go and find revenue that is not all passed back to our property tax owners? I think there's a lot of ways that we can do that and that the city, frankly, is doing it, right? We're seeing five, almost six billion dollars of permitted properties that means our overall tax base is going up so how do we make sure that we are continuing to grow responsibly bringing those buildings online so that they can be revenue producers what was an empty lot is now producing revenue right that keeps us from passing that cost on to taxpayers it's also I think thinking and acting with a is sort of a conservative voice with our legislature and our general assembly that says um, Look, the cost of growth, uh, we need to match here the site of growth. So when we service all of this, uh, all, all of the business of the city that collects a huge amount of sales tax dollars for the state, 20 years ago, we used to get a bigger share of that. And I think it'll take a conservative voice to say, hey, that was a period of austerity. We uh, started to take less of the state tax dollars then. It's probably time now because our police officers are serving um, uh, citizens, if you call 911, if you're from Sumner County, we're taking care of you here, right? Our roads, when we're repairing your roads, if you're driving in from Wilson County, we're taking care of those here. So it's starting to say, how do we get some more of those dollars uh, here? And I think we can do that. Well, that's interesting that you, you bring that up. You say on the campaign trail a lot that Nashville is overtaxed compared to the rest of the state. Yeah. But uh, what you're saying there is, uh, it remi reminds me of this analysis that the Tennessee Lookout did. They mm -hmm. compared all the counties in the state as far as what revenue they were sending to the state and what they were yeah. getting back from the state. Yeah. Nashville was head and shoulders the most in terms of what it was putting in mm -hmm. and then net not yeah. receiving in return. Yeah. So, so are you saying that Nashville being overtaxed is a state issue in this case? Uh, no, I think overall our, our, our taxation there is a, is a property tax issue, right? Like when we sort of look economically at what you are paying out of your pocket, right? Pe people in the sort of city hall crowd, they say our rate is really low. Well, your rate is not what you pay. You, you are paying, if we look at a median family here in Davidson County making a decision and looking at their property tax bill, it's probably three times higher than most of our adjoining counties. Um, the question on the split between the city's share or the local share and the state share it, it is, a, is a conversation I know the Tennessee Municipal League is, is leading. It's one um, that, uh, that I think we have to look at um, that, that, is, that in 2002 we, we shifted um, that, that dollar figure and I think we've got to bring it a little bit back into balance. And I don't think we're alone as a city in seeing that. How do you think you can have that conversation with the state? It seems like one that they might not be eager to have in terms mm -hmm. of redistributing revenues. Well, um, I, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, how to have that conversation with the state is, um, it is to come at it from a conservative position that says, I want when you are here in Nashville to make sure that our police call times are not as long as they are right now. We need this to be a safe city. Um, and so I think that it, it, part of that is saying we will prioritize the funding of our police force and letting our police officers do their job. We've got to make sure that the dollars, um, as, we're, as we're making sure that the city is safe, that we've got the sales tax dollars here uh, to deliver that service. You know, part of your pitch is that conservative uh, viewpoint and maybe a more familiarity with the, the people up on Capitol Hill um, and a, a ability to talk with them maybe mm -hmm. more productively, mm -hmm. I think is a, a fair way of describing yeah. how you've positioned yourself. Yeah. So I know that gun control is not really within the purview of the mayor's yeah. office, but with the special session coming up, yeah. um, what would you do as mayor to lobby on that front? Do you think what they're planning to do, I don't know if you've seen the mm -hmm. outline, uh, is enough or? Uh, yeah, 
Well, um, so I, uh, I support the governor's call for a special session. Um, he, I, I think it's, is it 17 points? Uh, so I don't think anyone has yet seen all of the legislation that's come out. We've seen the scope mm -hmm. of where that is. And, and the, the question of working well with the General Assembly, look, you have, um, in, in the scope, you've got legislation that I know Mike Sparks out of Smyrna has been pushing for a long time, the uh, lowering the tax or eliminating the tax on gun storage, right, That and, and, and gun safes. That makes a lot of sense. You have, I, I don't know, I haven't seen the legislation, but you have in that call and that charge, how do we have more mental health beds for our state, right? Right now in a state of 7 million people, we only have about 600 state-funded mental health beds. I think you'll see either in the special session or soon uh, a call from Chairman Sapicki uh, to, to come up with a plan uh, to build uh, an, an enormous amount of additional capacity for mental health beds, right? These are things that are not Nashville problems alone. They are state problems and saying, what's the problem? How do I come up with the solution? Um, and then in terms of the question on the, uh, on, 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 you know, overall on, on that, I, back in April, signed the Safer Tennessee Pledge. I just don't operate in the world of Instagram and sort of ginning everyone up. I signed that. I was there with Caroline Young, the past president of the Nashville Healthcare Council that day with families. In front of my house, I don't have an Alice Rowley yard sign. I have a sign for the Covenant families. Um, I, I think that there is a place, and the governor um, and I'm hopeful that we will get there. There is a place, if we right now can separate children from their parents, if their parent is drug addicted or has a mental health crisis, I think that we should be able to temporarily separate a firearm from that individual having a mental health crisis mm -hmm. um, or a drug addiction. And, and I think the courts have proven the ability to do that with something as important as children. I think that we can figure out a way uh, to do that, and I hope that the General Assembly will do that. In terms of how I advocate for it, I reached out to my state senator, who's uh, Senator Yarbrough, and I said I'd love I'd love to be able to help. Um, and you know, and uh, and and I'm ready, and I'm happy to help. I live in Senate District 21, and so if you'd like me to come help as we uh, work through that in the next couple of weeks, um, ready to do that. Um, so during this campaign, you've talked about uh, tax rate. Um, you talked about uh, crime and yeah. the lack of resources for the police force. Um, with all these concerns, the, the city's finances mm -hmm. in general, with all these concerns that you had, yep. why did you wait until the current mayor decided not to run to get into the race? Oh, that's, uh, well, um, I, uh, I have a lot of respect for John Cooper. You know, I worked with him very closely when we put together the coalition to save Fort Negley. Um, I think that he has served our city in what is the time of Job. I mean, a derecho, uh, Christmas Day bombing, COVID. Uh, he, he has had a tough administration. Um, and uh, I, I, fr frankly, um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have seen um, a path that said, "How, how are we going to bring the city together?" If it was fighting against the person who had tried to hold the city together through that period of time, um, and so it, it didn't make sense to me until he made the decision not to run uh, to join to join the race. Gotcha. And it's my understanding that the state comptroller has, in, largely in response to some of the things Mayor Cooper has done, sort of uh, given the city a cleaner bill of health yep. in terms of its finances. Yep. So are you less concerned about that as an issue? I know it's one of your big Yeah, well, points. when I, when, um, the reason I have talked uh, about the city's debt is it is a report card of how we've run the city for the last 20 years, right? 15, 16 years. Every year we've run the city, um, we have, uh, spent more than we've taken in right and we've done and we've done that pretty consistently and so where does that report card end up living it ends up living uh, in the in the city's total debt mayor cooper and this council have on the in the question of following what is a best practice for cities have restored the rainy day fund a fund that was rated uh, for you know probably a, a decade right we we allowed it in some of our biggest boom times we looked the other way and instead of uh, making sure that we had a rainy day fund, we let it become depleted, and then when it started raining, 
uh, we were out of money. So I, um, I'm glad and, uh, and will continue to uphold that this city should have a functional reserve balance. And I think that that's where you see, um, y y I think that's where you see a shift in what the comptroller's view is of the city right now. You, you mentioned Fort Negley uh, earlier. I think that's when I first uh, became aware of who you yeah. were. Yeah. Because I moved here in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you and, and the now mayor and the rest of the coalition yeah. were successful, I guess, in, in stopping the development that was planned there. Yeah. Um, but today, uh, that property is fenced off. There's, you know, weeds growing. Yeah. It's not being put to use or being preserved in any yeah. real way. What do you think should have been done in the, those years since that? Or what would you do as mayor? Oh, I, I take issue with the statement that it's not. If you go and walk, walk Fort Negley, have you walked it in the last couple of months? The, I, I'm specifically talking about the area where the baseball stadium is. Mm, yeah. Well, so here, here's, here's a little bit of a, of a challenge uh, there. Um, that land was given to the city in 1928 to be a park. In 2007, the city and the Metro, Metro Historic uh, Commission said that it would all be a park, period. Uh, then uh, we had the plan to play that said in 386 pages, we didn't have enough public park land. And yet we had a mayor who said, let's put 27 buildings on park land. So what we have seen both with the Bass Street families and with the larger archeological study that needed to be done and the community conversation, you now have a plan for how that should be appropriately developed. You have a plan that has the buy-in of those really important uh, groups that had been neglected and their voices had been neglected. Uh, you have in this most recent budget, I believe $17 million to do the build out of that park. Uh, so would I have liked to have seen that two years ago come to fruition? Sure. But two years ago, we were in the middle of kind of a COVID era government where uh, we couldn't have appropriately had those conversations and, bring, and brought in uh, both the, uh, the archaeologists and then also the families who are so impacted and want to make sure they're part of the story. So I, I, I look at that really generationally, right? That land was given in 1928. I, I think it will be, and when we were in the trenches of that fight, I, I think it'll be 2028 when it sees its full potential. And somebody might be frustrated uh, at the amount of time that it took to get us there. Uh, but I'm going to be glad uh, to cut the ribbon and to make sure that the entire park is, is open. Um, I was listening to an interview with you talking about the last transit referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that one of the failures was not including the surrounding counties. Yep. Um, I, I seem to remember that part of the idea, at least at the time, was that these train lines could be extended into the surrounding counties mm -hmm. if those counties would have a referendum of their own at some yeah. later date. So yeah. would you push for some sort of coordinated um, effort where all of these surrounding counties are voting at the same time? Or how, how would you actually push to make that a reality? Well, I mean, I think it starts uh, with going, as I have, to go see Mayor Ken Moore, who's the head of the 70 Mayor's Caucus, to go see Rogers Anderson down in Williamson County, Joe Carr, Mayor of Sumner County. Uh, I had lunch with a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't see our regional neighbors um, seeing a train that runs from Hendersonville to downtown. I see now uh, where we are today, uh, the cost, right, zoning laws downtown have changed where we no longer have parking minimums. And so what does that mean? That means that parking, the cost of parking is going to continue to go up. That will start to change behaviors because pocketbooks ultimately change behaviors. So I see um, as, a, as a first step with our regional mayor, so we're saying, what's that last mile congestion? That hurts Davidson County residents the most. So how do we start to collect cars from our surrounding counties and make uh, a goal that maybe public transportation is not your entire route, but that increasingly it is a part of your route, those, those last mile pieces. Um, and then I, you know, and then I also um, think uh, that, um, that, that when we think about transit uh, and we think about congestion, right, um, think about heart surgery. You can't save a heart without having a bypass. So I do think that there is a really specific place to helping think through, and I think some of these plans are doing that, about how do we help relieve congestion that is coming through the city that maybe doesn't need to on our interstate corridors. 
You mentioned Joe Carr. Yeah. I read recently where he's uh, talking about pushing the state legislature to allow Rutherford County uh, to enact impact fees, helping offset the cost of development there. Yeah. Rutherford County's growing a lot. Yeah. Nash Nashville's growing a lot. Nashville's not allowed to do impact I know. fees. Is I know. that something that you would go up to the Capitol and ask for? Uh, absolutely, and I think I will ask for it in a really unique way because I don't care who gets the credit. I care that we get the result. And so Joe Carr and Mayor Sheila Butt down in uh, Murray County, but Joe Carr specifically, he knows he and us, we are on the wrong side of a 2006 state law that says we cannot charge impact fees. Williamson County Mayor Anderson, he's on the right side of that law. That's why you see our neighbors be able to match the cost of growth, impact fees at the site of growth, and that we are not passing all those costs of new building, new construction onto longtime residents. So absolutely, um, I welcome the opportunity to work with Joe Carr. And frankly, I think acting with that sort of humility that says he's got the same problem, he's on the wrong side of that law, he has probably more votes uh, and more sway. And so instead of saying, I have to be the one that's right, but to say, how can I be part of your team? Um, how can we get that law changed? It's going to benefit his residents. It's going to benefit our residents. Um, and, and I'm excited to work with him. I talked to him about that at length. What does the real estate community here in Nashville have to say about that? Well, I'm sure uh, there are parts of the real estate community. Uh, actually, one of my um, bigger supporters, he said to me early on, he said, I pay Williamson County impact fees. Why don't I do that here? I'm confident there is a part of the real estate community watching this and saying, we're going to lawyer up and lobby up and we're going to take you down. I will say this. Uh, it took us three years in Governor Haslam's administration to break uh, a what was frankly a monopolistic practice in the state. Um, where we were not at the time allowing our rural uh, telco providers to be able to, or uh, rural electric co-ops to be able to pull broadband. It was one of the biggest challenges for broadband expansion in the state. It took three sessions of the General Assembly, but when something makes sense enough and enough people are with you, um, I, I, I think that longtime residents, um, and, I, and I frankly I think there's plenty in the development community that kind of say, hey, we pay these one county over, how come we don't pay them uh, here? Um, you've said a few times that uh, you think that we should let the police do their job. Yep. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I think frequently uh, we are asking the police to operate uh, differently for different populations. So what I mean is like take a, take a homeless encampment, people experiencing homelessness, we I think with the new funding that's come in, uh, we are working aggressively uh, to improve that situation, to create more permanent supportive housing, which I support. But we also frequently kind of say, if there's a crime happening, if there's an assault happening, if there's a drug deal happening, we're not supposed to police that because of where it's happening. And that's what I mean about saying that letting the police uh, do, uh, do their job. Look, you've got downtown business owners that'll say it frustrates them that they're watching somebody you know, urinate in public and nobody is making an arrest or issuing a citation. And there, there seems to be a little bit of a sense of look the other way for certain things. Um, and, and I don't know exactly where that's coming from, but I think that it doesn't make, um, so, so somewhere along the way, there's some mixed signals about, about letting folks do their job. Okay. Uh, I want to conclude by talking a little bit about the politics of the race. Yeah. Tried to stick with more policy yeah. stuff yeah. to start, but. Yeah. Um, so I, I saw the map of the, the precincts and where you were in the lead and where the other candidates yeah. were in the lead, and it's pretty stark, uh, mm. donut shape. Yeah. Um, with you know you kind of doing well in the outer uh, areas of the county, mm -hmm. and uh, mostly Freddie O'Connell, your opponent, doing well in the center part of the county. Uh, so how do you propose to? Well, you know, first of all, in the campaign, get some people in the center part of the city to vote for you. Mm -hmm. But also, if you were to win, govern for those people who yeah. clearly it's a concentrated yeah. divide between these two voters. Well, I think for every uh, business person watching this or political watcher, look, I, I was outspent eight to one. I got into the race a full year after the other top contenders. So um, when you run an abbreviated campaign uh, when you run um, with uh, massively outspent by the rest of the field. I mean, look, look at the dollars per vote. Where did I come in and where did everybody else come in? It's stark. It's a stark difference. 
uh, you amass uh, your resources uh, where, where you need to. Uh, running a primary campaign and a general campaign are totally different, right? So now, this morning, um, one of our unfortunately lowest turnout areas uh, was in, in South Nashville. Uh, one of the first endorsements we have, uh, we, we have come out with is from Fran Bush, a former MNPS a school board member from the Cane Ridge Cluster, an area that irrespective of how you ran or who you won, the neighborhood didn't vote, right? And so how do we start uh, to make sure that our message and our message uh, is reaching more communities? I mean, we're, do we're doing that now. And building on that, uh, one of your top advisors, I guess, is David Fox, who yeah. ran eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and people have compared this race to that one. I know you've tried to play that down somewhat, but the reality is he, in the general election, um, it was a sort of similar breakdown in the, uh, mm -hmm. the first round. In the general election, he lost by, I think, 10 points yeah. or so. Yeah. Uh, since then, Donald Trump was elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like uh, Nashville maybe has been pushed more towards uh, liberal or progressive votes, mm -hmm. um, even since he lost by 10 points. Yeah. So how can you do better than he did? Well. Those are all national political issues, right? Nashville, uh, eight years ago, the majority of voters believed we were going in the right direction. So David was presenting a change from that direction. There was a city council member running who had been in the city council for eight years, and so her candidacy represented no change. The majority of Nashville voters then didn't want to change. What's different today, eight years later here in Nashville? What's different today is the overwhelming majority believe the city is going in the wrong direction. So if we do what we did eight years ago, which is elect a city council person who's served as part of this where we've gotten, and we move them over to the mayor's office, I think there are a lot of parallels. I, th I think that, this, that the voters today kind of say, we, we got to reset how we're doing things here. Um, and so I, I think separate from national political, it's, look at what Nashville is. Nashville voters are saying to us, uh, we need to bring uh, a different approach to how, we manage, uh, to how we manage the city. And on election night in your speech, you said, do, you asked the crowd, do we believe that letting the city council run the city yeah. is a good idea? Was yeah. that in reference to electing a city council yes. member? Yeah, or? that was the, for three times in a row, right? So the so last it, three mayors have all come from the city council to the mayor's office. So just to right? clarify, you're, you're not saying that the elected members of the city council no. should not have a role. No, in no, no. It, it is, and you know, 10 o'clock at night, Alice Rowley yeah. has never been elected before. Um, and maybe we'll have a little bit of grace, but three mayors in a row, the city today after those three mayors in a row, eight years, believes we're going in the wrong direction. And what has happened in common with all three? They well, all come from the city council to the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. And so that, that is fundamentally, I, th I think, the distinction for voters. It is not a R, D, whatever. It is a different type of leadership, a different type of approach to governing. Um, it's not, um, that, that, that's really what I meant. And I, and I know that uh, I've, I've left Twitter, uh, so all the people uh, on Twitter, um, because, you know, all these things I'm learning about myself that are not, <laughs> like, I think pastors are writing me saying, Alice, you're the woman who uh, saved Fort Negley. You're the woman who can save Nashville. You are the woman who can uniquely move us past this tribalism. Uh, it's not a way that I've operated, um, you know, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I apologize to the council. Uh, it was more of a sense of we've had three mayors in a row that have come that way. And maybe if we're serious about changing something, we shouldn't keep doing that. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thanks.